how are you? Okay, I'm fine. How are you? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Good Friday. Yes, it is. Although it's weird, weird today here. I'm sorry? It's weird here where we are. We got a winter storm. Yeah, it's been uh, really uh, wintry here too today. I noticed all around the world, yeah. Yeah? It's been a very intense day. How, uh, well, your day is just starting, but... Well, I had to get up and shovel my wife's car out so she could get to work. So we had about six inches of snow. Wow. Yep. You're living in Colorado, right? Colorado mountains, yep. Wow, do you like it there? I do. It's one of my favorite states in the U.S. Are you native uh, Colorado? Oh, no. I was born in New York City. Mm. Oh, right. You told me. The land of, yeah, where most Jews are in the U.S. So when did you move to Colorado? Uh, I lived 22 years in California. I moved to Colorado in 1994, so it's now 26 years. Mm. Do you consider yourself a hippie? Ex-hippie. I guess there's no such thing, yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, I say, people say ex-hippie, but I say oh. there's no such thing. Yeah, of course not. How can this be? No, of course not. Well, yes, well, in my perspective, uh, it's been a hell of a week. Did, uh, you, did, did Zohar have a happy birthday? She had a very energetically emotional um, birthday. Like she oh. has uh, every year for the past um, nine years because... Oh. Uh, How old is she? She's uh, 17 now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Big year, big year. Sure, of course. Hormones are going crazy. But not just because of that, but because uh, very close to her birthday, she lost three uh, family and significant others in her three? life. Three? Three? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. First of all, it was uh, her best friend when they were five. Uh, she, 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 we lost her to cancer. Oh, it's a shame. They're too young. Yeah. And when we were, li we were living in India at the time for two years, me and my husband, my ex-husband and Zoa, she was two and a half. And she, we met their really nice Israeli family and they became, became like best friends for two years. And then she had a very sudden burst of leukemia and she Ooh. passed on after a month and a half. Um, so this was very difficult. And when she was nine, she lost her grandmother uh -huh. like a day after her birthday. And last year we lost her, uh, her grandfather also uh -huh. on the same day. So it's, you know, she got this very, Difficult channel, uh, challenge of uh, experiencing life and death as turning doors, you know, revolving doors. Yes. Like in and out and in and out. And it's, it's a lot for a kid her age. Sure. Absolutely. I understand. It's a lot for a guy any age. So. Yeah. Well, I've lost three people in the last couple of months, too. It seems to come in threes sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? So, lately? Yeah. Um, you know, I just find out the older you get, the more people drop away around you that you, you know. I mean, it's just a fact of life. So I've lost a lot of people in my, my age group and younger in the last couple of years, sure. Yeah, it's all around us uh, all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been thinking um, a lot. I've been feeling that this times, and especially the last... Uh, month or two months have been you know really cooking my dna really really well yep well this year it's going to be a tough year it is yeah yeah i know and uh it's been it's been already it's been it started and this week was like okay fry me destiny yep. like uh, you know it's like putting on a lot of pressure and uh also uh watching uh the Dune, Dune movie uh, two weeks ago. Which movie? Dune. Oh, Dune. Oh, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. Uh, with her, first time for her. So this also has a lot of uh, very, very relevant 
message for us humans in this time. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Dune has, uh, Dune by, uh, what's his name, uh, Herbert? Frank, Frank Herbert. Herbert. Frank Herbert, yeah. Um, carries a very deep uh, ecological and spiritual message. That well, there, there's a whole other story about that. There originally, the, fir the film that was supposed to be made about Doom was going to be made by the Argentinian director, Alejandro Jodorowsky. I don't know if you know who he is. Yes, I know the story. Okay, well, his, his, his Doom was going to be off the hook, and, and the producers couldn't handle it. Mm. But I really like uh, David Lynch's Dune as well, and I love the book. So um, it's a classic. Yeah, I, I think uh, we, it's very relevant to, to read it um, in this day and age and to understand the message. And also a spiritual message to understand, you know, they made, he mentions there the, the term of uh, the star seed being the seed and that uh, to, be, to uh, become a true human, you yeah. have to endure pain, you have to overcome a lot of pressure. And uh, I think this is what is happening to us because you know, we can also say like Hakeem says and like you say, and also I believe this and also Nassim Harman says uh, that um, everything, all this chaos, all this apocalyptic, apocalyptic feel is uh, a natural process in the evolution of a society to be yeah. on the brink of extinction you know the story of the the primordial bacteria no this it's, is from Nas Nassim yes um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a fan of his to be honest with you hmm. I, but let me, I, let me just say that it is just a product of the cycle. It's yeah, not something yeah. that happens. It's inevitable to happen forever. And as we talked about, which is more, becoming more and more apparent, we're only in a 10,000-year window. If you look at our planet on a geological scale, the whole arisal of civilizations and, and this current 10,000 years is a blip. It's just a safe period. Basically, the climate changes we're seeing coming is more like the norm of what's been the Earth's history, which has been violent, and and uh, you know we're in the sixth extinction now, so we're basically in a, a lull. We've been in a ten thousand year geological lull, and uh, that's changing now, because the end of the cycle is always severe Earth changes, always. So. Um, I would say to, as I've said again before, by 2050, there's not going to be 10 billion people on this planet. No way. Uh, yeah, you may be right. Um, I'm, af I'm afraid I know I'm right. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. Again, the Chinese proverb, may you be born in interesting times. This is, uh, in a sense, maybe what it feels to exist in between worlds when you see um, the negativity being so out there and the positivity being so out there and the, the gap, the chasm between them. And I was just thinking before I uh, started the, the conversation that is one of my uh, personal lessons these times is that we have to learn to become bigger than anything that happens to us. Mm. Well, I mean, it, it, the only way humans can survive now is having a spiritual foundation. If you don't, you're lost. Yeah. And that's yeah. not religion. Religion is not spirituality, which is the second book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I think this, that's why it's so important to teach about ancient Egypt now because... Uh, it's, it's so helpful to understand exactly because they had such an amazing way to describe the cycles and to describe the archetypes and uh, to describe um, the sacred science. And actually that's what I uh, wanted us to, to touch on today. Um, well, it, it's, like, it's like I, teach, I tell people that 
what Hakim taught and what is the ancient Commission wisdom is to understand the big picture, that we're only a little blip in the scheme of things with the netters. And, and even though, you know, we talk about dynastic Kemet slipping, falling into patriarchy, falling into corruption, et cetera, et cetera, because it was Amun, they still understood their place in the big picture. Human beings today don't understand their place. And that comes back to we, who we talked about, who I want to bring up again today, Joseph Campbell, because it's very interesting that the American basketball star that just passed away, Kobe Bryant, was about to engage in a whole second phase of his life being an active producer. You know, he won an Oscar for an animated short. He was going to do a project on Joseph Campbell. He became a big fan. He was reading Joseph Campbell religiously, and he was going to do a major project based on the works of Joseph Campbell. Wow. Yeah, he had that in the works. And I'm glad because Joseph Campbell needs to be brought back. I mean, the idea that we don't understand our myths, we don't understand our place in the big picture. And that's when I opened up this, this last tour that I gave and gave a, a lecture uh, from Light into, when I was doing my uh, initial uh, Land of Osiris lecture and I was talking about Hakim, I said, this is the big thing that I want you all to understand that Hakim taught us to see the big picture, to see our insignificant little place in the cosmos. And that's how the Commission saw life. And that's how the ancients saw life, even before the Commissions, understood that we're only a small part of the big picture. Today, humans think we are the big picture. And there's nothing else besides us, which is utter nonsense. Yes, and uh, that's why I think uh, I am so spot on with this next workshop I'm going to do about ancient Egypt, this collaboration I told you about last week, um, a collaboration I'm doing with uh, a dream, uh, lucid dreaming researcher and herbalist and doula called uh, Tamari Monsiton. And we're going to do a workshop that I'm going to explain about the cosmology of and mythology of ancient Egypt. And she is going to talk about dream work and Great. dream plants. Uh, uh, have either one of you ever heard of the Tibetan practice of Zabchen? Yes, of course. That's lucid dreaming. Yeah. That is what the priests, the Commission priests could do. They could program their dreams. And we believe that when, especially the priests and priestesses, when they went into the dream world, they went into other dimensions. And they actually sent their consciousness to other dimensions. And most people today don't know their dreams, don't remember their dreams, don't connect with their dreams. So that's important work. Dream work is important. It was that's, one exactly, of yeah. that's exactly what I'm saying, that we have to teach and to make people understand how important is the role of, of uh, active dreaming, of lucid dreaming. Lu lucid dreaming, lucid dreaming. dreaming. And you can, you can teach people to program their dreams before yes. they go to sleep. Yes, exactly. Do you do that? Uh, sometimes. I don't anymore. I don't remember much of my dreams. But I do get into a thing before I fall asleep where I start to think maybe of past events, of different things that have happened, and that usually puts me into dream state. But... Uh, it's been told that people who smoke a lot of cannabis don't remember their dreams as much as people who don't. And that may be true of me because I don't, I know I dream. Sometimes I remember only loose fragments, but I don't remember full dreams anymore. Because you smoke a lot of cannabis? Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Even though not in the last month. It's like, it's in periods for me. Yeah, well, I, we, I grow my own here in Colorado. I, oh, I, 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 legal, I legally can grow 12 plants a year for my wow, life. Oh, you lucky bastard. And unfortunately, though, the, <laughs> weather has ki the weather has killed us in the last couple of years because uh, Colorado's growing season is getting shorter and shorter. I mean, we used to have a rule of thumb here that yeah. we don't... I'll wait for you to come back. Just, uh, it's okay, it's okay. We usually had a rule of thumb that we don't plant until Mother's Day. Mother's Day in, in America is around May 10th, around second week of, weekend of May. That used to be it. We don't plant because it can snow here way up until May. In fact, it has been recorded on record that it has slowed, snowed in Denver, Colorado on July 4th. It didn't stick, but it snowed. But I've seen snow stick here up until May. So it's very dicey when people start to plant 
and then you get a freeze and that kills your plants. So, but the last couple of years we've had hail, hail in May, hail in June, and hail in July. And, and the can, you know, I'm going on here, but just to, to make a point, cannabis plants are very hardy. Once they start growing, they can take it. They can take a freeze in October and still produce. But when they're young shoots, that's when they're most vulnerable, like young children, just like us. So if we get a freeze, in, like we got a, a, a hailstorm in July, it can damage the plants. So our crop last year, we had great plants, but a very low yield. I'm just about, I usually can last until April, May, and then I plant, and then I have to buy until I harvest in October. But now I'm running out. I'm just about out of my stash. And so- why, and, why don't you grow uh, indoors? It's very expensive. You need a lot of equipment. Very expensive production to do that. But you can get a lot of uh, crops for it. I know, but it costs thousands of dollars of lighting equipment to do. Yeah. <laughs> but it's beautiful to grow it outdoors and grow your own. There's nothing yeah. like growing your own. Or grow you with like, my... uh, like to make yourself like a small unit, you know. I, it's expensive. People do yeah. it, but it's very expensive. And you get a very high uh, energy bill because of that. Because yeah. you, you have to run it continually 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> I know all about growing, man. I mean, yes, I'm a hippie. I've been smoking for over 50 years. I first started in 1968. You weren't even born yet, so. <laughs> I was born five years later. That's right. I was already smoking. <laughs> so that's that. So, yes, that's why I love Colorado. It's one of 12 states in the U.S. It's legal. We've got three, three or four more states are going to be on the ballot in 2020. It's an inevitable because Canada is now legal. Mexico is about to become legal. There's Uruguay, there's Paraguay, there's Peru, Bolivia. So it's inevitable that the U.S. has to totally legalize. It's inevitable. I mean, Colorado's done very well, very well. Made, made well, hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. I, uh, when I was 23, I lived uh, almost a year in Chicago, I think I told you. And uh, I would love to come. Uh, I actually have this plan, like maybe in a few years to come and live in the United States for a few years, you know. Oh, great. Then we'll see you for sure. Yeah, maybe, yeah, California or... Um, yeah, California is a great place Colorado to live. Or uh, Oregon. Yeah, those are all legal states you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know because, uh, I'm a too. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, you know, it's very interesting. Some of the most outstanding research in cannabis that's been done in the last 30, 40 years is in Israel. Yeah, I know. It was in Israel that they made a direct link showing that not just CBDs, which we knew, and CBNs, which is the, I'm getting technical, but THC, which is a psychoactive plant, which gets you high. It was in, it was in Israel that they made the connection that, that THC is anti-carcinogenic too. And even though we are very advanced and also like a lot of the politicians own uh, cannabis fields. It's like still not, it's, yeah, but still not, not legal. Yes. Still not, still not legal. The, the hypocrisy, and you know, they even made it so hard for people who really, really need it medically to get it. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. Pretty horrifying what they're doing. And as even they pointed to excerpts in the Torah that could be talking about cannabis, about where God says be bountiful with the herbs the herbs of the earth that heal as well as as feed you yeah how I mean, are they how dare and people people for years have been asking me to find a relief in egypt that we know that they grew cannabis we know that i mean they've been making hashish in africa for over ten thousand years so it's obvious that they're but i've yet to see i've looked all over a relief on the walls in in egypt of the cannabis plant but we know that they grew it it's i mean it's so what is uh, on the head of uh, No, Seshat of, is not uh, cannabis. Seshat. No, Seshat is seven pointed flower. It's a lotus. It's not cannabis. The lotus? <laughs> lotus. Oh, I yeah. thought maybe it's the flower, the, the seed of life. Well, it's the same what the lotus is. The lotus is the same in Kemet as it is in India. It represents the flowering of the heart. The flowering of the lotus represents the opening of your heart. The same imagery in Asia is the same imagery in Africa. Commissions had lotuses all over the place. You used to see them in the, um, in the fountain, right before you go into the museum in Cairo, the old museum, which is being cleaned yeah. out now for the new museum. The new museum is supposed to open in the fall. But there used to be lotuses all in the fountain there. The, the name of my workshop with Tamar is uh, 
Brotherhood of the Blue Lotus. Beautiful. The Blue Astrology, Lotus. Blue, dream, did you, dream plants in ancient Egypt. Have you ever talked to Patricia Ariana about the research on the Blue Lotus? The Blue Lotus is the blue lily of the Nile. There were two lilies, the white lily of the Nile, and it was actually purple, but they called it the blue lily of the Nile. And it's, it was, it, there was an a article written in Rosicrucian Digest when I was involved with the Rosicrucians from a botanist who had studied it, that the blue lily of the Nile is a psychedelic plant. And it produces a psychedelic drink, and they drank it. So and you said, were, did, the commission, well. did the commissions get high? Most certainly. <laughs> yes. Well, certainly, like I said, tobacco has only been introduced into Egypt by the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. You see how they're addicted to tobacco in Egypt today? Everybody smokes. Everywhere they're smoking, smoking, she's here, she's smoking here, smoking there, smoking there. It's only in the last couple of hundred years. Before that, they only smoked hashish in the hookah pipes, not tobacco. It's only now, modern times. So when you see the Knights Templars, the images of the Templars, Marco Polo, or everybody who's coming to Egypt in the Middle Ages and they're sitting around with the hookahs, they're smoking hashish. And of course, that's the assassins. The assassins, the Ismaili sect of, of, of Islam, who are known as the hashishim assassins. But, you know, a lot of research shown that that's been blown out of proportion. They weren't, I mean, it, it doesn't come from hashish assassin, the assassins. It comes from a, a, a word that actually meant ruler overlords. But what the Knights Templars learned from the assassins was how to, how, to, how to fight warfare without getting a lot of people killed. The assassins had the idea of if you're going to go to war or conflict with another tribe or group or sect, you kill their leaders so that you don't have to go to war and have a lot of deaths. So the, the, the Knights Templars picked up on that. And there's a famous moment in history if you if you don't mind this little bit of digression uh, uh, august uh, october 13 1309 the uh, king of france and the pope declared war on the knights templars invaded them put them some escaped some didn't and etc and and uh, jacques de molay was put to death and etc well it's well known that the knights templars knew about the the attack that was coming and jacques de molay and the older knights stayed behind to sacrifice themselves. But the younger ones got away. We know that the Templars went to Portugal and they went to Scotland. And that's where the Scottish rites of masonry comes from. So there's the famous battle where the Scots were fighting for their independence against the Brits. It's called the Battle of Bannockburn. It was led by uh, 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 the Bruce, Robert, 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 Robert de Bruce. And uh, William Wallace, which the famous movie uh, Braveheart was made about. So in the battle, uh, typical in those days when the British would fight a battle, the soldiers would go in into a field and fight, and the king and the high uh, nobles of the court would stand on a mountain, a hilltop, and watch the battle. They wouldn't engage, of course. They would watch the battle. Of course, the Templars knew that. So the battle's going on, and the British are winning, and it looks like the Scots are going to lose. All of a sudden, there's a trumpet sounds, and you look up on another hill, and a whole bunch of no knights on horseback come, wearing the Red Cross. And as soon as the British soldiers saw who it was, they scared shitless and ran from the field. But the knights didn't go down into the battle. They headed to the hill where uh, uh, um, Lo Edward Longshanks, that's who it was, Longshanks, the king of England was. They saw the king saw something and they ran the hell out because they were going to go kill the king. And that would have ended the battle and Scots would have been freed. The Scots won the battle anyway because then the knights turned into the battle and routed the British army. Because the knights were the greatest warriors of their day. And that's a true story. So then, and they learned that from the assassins from the Middle East to go after the leaders in battle. So that you end a lot of, you can avoid a lot of bloodshed that way. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's talk a little bit. Let's go back to um, the, the origins of ancient Egypt. Uh, gradually we can do it. I, I would love to talk about the integration of the sacred science and how they connected uh, the, the ancient commissions because they had such a deep understanding of the cosmic cycles. Um, they had a very profound uh, sacred geometry and sacred science. Okay, it's, first of all, 
It's not the word integration. Just it's a minute. It's not the word. Uh, just, yeah, yeah, what is it? No, because there's no separation. So there was nothing to integrate. Okay. There was no well, separation from the sacred and the profane. Science was sacred. Everything was sacred. So whatever they did, whatever they knew, was part of their spiritual understanding. There was no sacred and profane. So it was all how they came to awareness, how they came to consciousness. Again, in the age of Aten, we're using 360 senses, say 25,000 years ago. So there's no hierarchy. In other words, there's no priests. There's no lesser above. Everybody has a function. Everybody has a role, but everybody understood they were part of the sesh. It was a group consciousness. So everything was in the corporate. Sacred science was the way of life. They wouldn't have called it that. It was just science. It was just understanding. It was walking with the netters. Once the, the senses start to wane and we're moving out of the age of Aten into the interregnum period, which lasted for thousands of years until we fell into the age of Amun, senses started to wane. Those who we called the early shamans who kept using certain practices, whether it was breathing exercises like yoga, using psychedelic plants, which they discovered, or all different techniques to keep their consciousness high, to keep the understanding that they are more than just the body. While everybody else was starting to wane, they became the Hanut. They created religion. They created the netter, the understanding of the netters, and that's the fall into Amun, where everybody then fell back into thinking we only have five senses. So it was, it was a gradual thousands of years until we totally fell. We say the age of Amun comes full around 4,000 years ago, around 2000 BCE, which is the astrological age of Aries. Aries, the ram, is the symbol of Amun at first. The first sign of Amun is the ram, the symbol of Aries. But there's thousands of years before that where we're falling into it. We're falling, 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 and religion starts. And, and the, so then the understanding of the netters as a teaching doesn't happen until we fall from it. It was not a teaching before then. It was an understanding. We all were using 360 senses. We all understood that we were part of the whole, that there was a bigger picture, that we were just a small piece part, but we all had our part to play, and everybody had their little function. Whether you became a geologist, whether you were, whether you were a scientist, whether you were a stonemason, whether you were a tattoo artist, whether you were a dancer, all were part of the culture. It doesn't become graded into, until we start labeling, as Hakim would always say, it's when we started labeling man, woman, man, that we separated. And that's what Amun's about, separation. We start labeling. We're, then the commissions started to look at themselves as separate from the rest of humanity, as superior. They considered the Greeks to be barbarians, you know. A commission would not eat off the same plate that a Greek had ate off of. <laughs> this is like in, 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 in the Middle Ages, where Gentiles wouldn't eat off the same plate that a Jew had eaten yes. off. You see? Okay, so if we, you know, before we, we talked about the Knights Templars a little bit and the Christian order, and we know that a lot of um, secret societies across the ages carried the ancient knowledge that came from uh, the, you know, the prehistoric East, and ancient Egypt and, and may probably uh, predating cultures that were there before um, the Great Flood. And I wanted to talk about, <coughs> because we've been talking in our, in our talks a lot about the actual meaning of the cycles, I would love for us to talk about um, The understanding of how, like if I can just say in the beginning that every, every mythology is actually based on cosmological events. Good. About uh, astrology and the, and, and the way, because we have metastructures, sacred geometry, a universal geometrical language, that governs everything. So there are material and spiritual patterns, and there mm. are inner patterns, psychological patterns within the human being. Mm. And the, the human being understands those outer patterns 
as sacred geometry through symbols and through uh, archetypes, um, psychological archetypes. And this is what is similar between the Hindu pantheon of gods and goddesses, uh, the Egyptian pantheon, and so and so. So I would love to get into the meaning of the actual netters in regard to cosmology. And, <laughs> that was that and, was the third the third book that Hakim and I were working on. Yeah, and, and, and it's that we we can't label them. You see, they have to label themselves. But let's talk about maybe uh, the most basic deities. I would love to, for myself, to, to get an order in them, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's begin with um, Atum. Ah, one of the original. Yes, ah, so let's start with the originals. Ah, Say about ah, the tomb. letter Atum. First, let's break the word down. Ah, tomb. The tomb, T-U-M, in commission, is Tehom in Hebrew, the deep. What is it in Hebrew? Tehom. Tehom. Of course, the deep. The void. The void. The uncreated that becomes created. What does Atom do? Atom is called, actually, the title is the great he, she. Okay? The great he, she. Tom, arising out of the primordial, as they pictured it, is that creation starts as a primordial mound, coming out of the deep, out of the void out of the uncreated, right? It comes up and it's the tum. It is the mound. He comes out of that, the great he, she, ah, tum, the great he, she. How does he create? He masturbates. He masturbates and brings all the other matters into creation, right? So, atom becomes a creator, the first idea of the creator, coming out of the primordial and, mound. And also but, the one who created it himself, right? Or itself. Right. Exactly, exactly. So that would be, that would be, that would be a level of creation. In other words, when they, in a true metaphysical sense, they, what they call the primal cause or the first cause is when something, and this is what I mentioned in my second book, From Light into Darkness, which the great physicist, Dr. Fred Allen Wolf said, is a conundrum in physics. How to explain that something that comes out of nothing, not logical. It cannot be understood logically, but this is how the Egyptians gave it a story, a myth to, to make people understand. The mound comes out of the nothing. Out of the mound comes this creature, a he, she, the great he, she, masturbates and creates the rest of the netters. So that was the original creation story to give people an understanding that we come from the larger, something comes from nothing. So again, that's why we, Hakim and I used to talk about this so much, why it is the physicists who are getting closer to chemistry than the Egyptologists who have no idea. The theoretical physicists who are now trying to show that the universe is conscious. Well, what was the first, the first letter that Hakim worked on me with that we were gonna work on our book? I was curious to see how he would chosen. And it's my wife, who's a long time student of metaphysics. She picked it up even before than I did. That when he started with number one, he did zim, the two hooks, which the one hook in Egyptology, because they make it an alpha beta, an alphabet they say is S or Z. He said, no, no, no. The two hooks were zim, consciousness, consciousness. You know what zim <laughs> is in Hebrew? You told me. We already did this, I think. What? Go ahead. The yeah, overlook. Like zman, that, zman, zman is time. Uh, doesn't it mean guardian too? Something about guardian? Or was that the netter? Netter. Netter. Yes. Okay. Well, Zim means consciousness, but Zim becomes Zen. That's the key thing. It becomes the Asian word, which nobody knows the origin. Ancient Chinese, ancient Korean, ancient Japanese. Nobody knows where Zen comes from. But it means meditation. And that's what Hakim was saying. Meditation equals consciousness. But what he was saying is that is God to the ancient Comitians. Consciousness. That's all it's there is. Rain? It's raining like crazy now. Oh, no kidding. And here I'm looking out the window, it's snowing. If I could turn the computer around, you'd see snow out my window. Yeah, show us some snow. You want to, let's see if I can do it. Can you see? Can you see? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Wow. Just, uh, typical in Colorado. This is not nothing new for us. But so that's the point. He was saying it starts from consciousness. Everything is, and that's why all of a sudden now, uh, the theoretical physicists make this incredible statement, which they think is new, saying, oh, the universe is conscious. Well, hello? We knew that 25,000 years ago. <laughs> so that's where it starts. That's where it starts. Consciousness. And then he would go on to the other network. So we can talk about them. You talk about Atom. Right. Atom becomes the first creation myth, the mythology of how creation happens. So and actually, you, we are talking about uh, a creation myth. This is That's the, right. The original, the original creation myth. The original was Atom. Yeah, that was your, then becomes Osiris and, and the rest of them become, then Jehuti becomes a creator. Each, each different gnome or each different religious center then created a mythology based upon their nectar. So in other words, at, at Abydos, they would have created a creation myth around Osiris, around Wizard. They would have created at Philae a creation myth around Isaac, Isis, etc., etc. Each one had a different creation myth. Atom is first. But I, uh, Osiris and Isis are as primordial as Atum? Yes, they're the sons of. The but, sons then of. They, but then they replace. In other words, in each center, the, the, the child would replace the parent. So in other words, Atum is original. But once you start having different religious centers, like Un, which became uh, Anu, which is Heliopolis today, which you know is one of the oldest religious centers of the old kingdom, there... They, rec they recognize the second stage of the sun. Ooh, not even past Kheper. Kheper was older. We, don't, we haven't found any primordial temples of Kheper, but they will be found. Like, I, you know, I said, I haven't found Kheper on the walls with the four different elements, but it's there. And I know, again, Fami will be the one to find it. It's again, this goes back to uh, what I know we wanted to discuss, this recent discovery in Israel. And Fami and I have been discussing it. They may have found the Temple of Solomon. For years, there was an archaeological mystery. The Temple Mount, as it is today, Herod's Temple, the second temple, uh, uh, they believed was built on top of the original temple, the Temple of Solomon. But yet they've been excavating under the temple for years. Again, go back to the Knights Templars. They came to Egypt and they excavated under the Temple Mount looking for the Ark of the Covenant. So in all these excavations, they have never found any ruins, any evidence of the original temple. Now you have this amazing discovery of a huge temple complex, not where the Temple Mount is, but close to it, and that may have been the Temple of Solomon. How both Fami and I agree this may be a discovery of the last 50 years. This may be, must be the and major are discovery. They, uh, dated? they have to date. I haven't seen any details yet, but uh, they'll date it. It'll be, it'll be about 3,000 years old, almost 3,000 years but old. Do you think it, it will be Egyptian style or not? Yes, of course. Wow. All, the all the original temples throughout everywhere. Greek temples, uh, uh, Babylonian temples, Assyrian temples, uh, 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 ancient Jewish temples were all built on the, the model of the Commission temple. Wow. Yeah. That would be amazing if they would, found, they would find lotuses in it. And artifacts, artifacts and documents. And, uh, I mean, things that could directly link to Solomon would be proof, absolute proof. Oh, wow, that would be the day. Known in Africa as Suleiman. And even uh, Egyptians, again, as I said, Egyptians call, named their children Abraham, uh, Ibrahim, Yosef, uh, 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 <laughs> and uh, Suleiman. In fact, um, Hakim's, one of Hakim's sons, Har Harun, had a son while I was there, and he named him Suleiman. It's Solomon. It's all in English. <laughs> so maybe that so, so so then so then to discuss the different letters we could go on forever i mean there's 360 you want to talk about isis you want to talk about cyrus that'll take hours and hours and hours in itself each letter had a meaning each letter had a function each letter had a temple site had a had an area so originally there had well, to be 300 so is uh there is also the term of noon right so is noon parallel to atum no noon is the water Tum, tum, T-U-M, is where Atom comes from. The nun, N-U-N, is a primarily your waters. So what is the difference? It's water. That is actually one of the terms that the commissions use. You know, the, the, remember I showed you the wavy line? Actually, the sign that looks like Aquarius? That's nun. 
that means water. It also means river, ocean, lake. So but they, commissions had, but the commissions had at least four different terms for water. Like the Greeks had five different terms of love, agape, eros, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The commissions had at least four terms that we know that were related to water. That's how important it was. Which are? Uh, well, there's asgat, none, and I don't know the others. I'm sure Tommy does. So, would you compare the term noon, the primordial waters, to what they call in uh, unified physics um, the plasmatic universe? Ooh. I'd have to think about that. I don't know if that's exactly, but it is, again, Tehom is the deep, the void, nothing. None is the primordial waters. So it's say, actually, if you look at, and it's the same in Genesis, uh, the waters are created before the earth. Where are the waters if there's no earth? But it talks about none before the earth, before uh, uh, the earth itself. So what is the difference between noon and tef? Tef is spit, saliva. So this is also humidity. Moisture. Talk about moisture. Yes. Moisture and humidity, right. Also tef is humidity, moisture, right. It's another word for liquid. So tef is also, would be another one. Tef nut, because she spits on the ground. So tef and noon is basically the same? No. See, they're different concepts. No. There's no physical none. It's the primordial waters, but it's not H2O. It's not yet physical water until the earth is created. So tef is H2O? Yes, spit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And atum is also the atom, right? Atom. That's what Patricia, Patricia Aoyan does that in her lectures. Yes. Atom is atom, 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 the atom, basic point of creation, right? It all relates. All of physics, they will so find atom, out, is commission so, wisdom. So we can also say that atom is the unified field. Or the building blocks, the building blocks of building creation. Blocks. Yes. Of creation, atoms. Yes. This is maybe the uh, masculine side of sacred geometry, the lines and the angles and the relationships between uh, areas. The key understanding is once it starts being taught and once it's written down, it is already broken into masculine and feminine. In other words, once they start teaching it, they're already making the label. Again, we're heading towards Amun. We're not exactly in Amun. Before 2000 BC, this can go back to 8000 BCE, which we say is when the goddess religions were formed. They were starting to think then in terms of separation. Amun was coming in, female and male, masculine, feminine. That's why Hakim would say 360 netters, 180 we label feminine, 180 we label masculine. We create the separation. But yeah, sure. So then when you start having the teachings, it's already, again, the original term was chem. Chem. Al chem. When they add the T ending to chemit, the T becomes feminine. So the land already becomes feminine. So it's already dividing into masculine and feminine. In Kemetian mythology, is the only one different than Native American mythology, Egyptian mythology, uh, Indian mythology, where you have duality. We have the sun, both masculine and feminine. The moon, both masculine and feminine. Earth, both masculine and feminine. You have uh, um, jib, geb, which is a masculine of the earth. But uh, um, nebchet, which is nephthys, is the feminine of the earth. The only one. So like in Native American philosophy, the, earth, the sun is masculine, the, earth is fe the moon is feminine, and the earth is feminine. They are already separating out in commission, they had duality. Each principle had a masculine feminine nature. That's why there's 360, 180 masculine, 180 feminine. So for every male masculine letter, you can find a feminine counterpoint. So the primordial waters, um, noon, none. 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 Yeah. So the primordial waters, noon, and then out. becomes then becomes a goddess. When they put the T ending, it's nunet. 
and becomes a feminine aspect of the primordial water, a goddess. You see, that's how they, you just put the T on it. I, I, Z, uh, uh, wizard becomes I, I, Z, because they put the T in it. Everything, you know, they just, except for Hathor, which is still part, is an ancient, ancient term. That's why she doesn't have a T ending. Hat Hor, the place of the boy, the place where the boy becomes a man. So in other words, in other words, to the commissions, men never became men without the feminine being involved, without their mother, their sister, their wife, their daughter, their lover, et cetera, et cetera. Men were never considered whole within themselves. They were only a function of the feminine that they were. That's a matriarchal understanding. Not so today. Today, men are up here, women are down there. One thing I could never understand when I was growing up and going into shul, why did the women have to sit apart? I, mean, I went to a, it was a conservative shul. I mean, it's even worse than orthodox. In orthodox, the women usually sit upstairs and the men downstairs. Yeah, At least here, in conservative, the women sit on the side and the men sit. I, I used to have a lot of girlfriends, a lot of fr women, girls that I knew from school. Why couldn't we sit together? I didn't understand. Oh, that, you know, but that's the way it is. That's the way the Torah is. You know, they they said when Sitchin, Zechariah Sitchin was was growing up in Israel. It was Palestine then, uh, and they asked him. He questioned the Torah one day in in a class, and the teacher said to him, "Sitchin, you don't question the Torah. Sit down." And that's it. <laughs> no that's more discussion. What they say. Don't question uh, what is uh, beyond you. <laughs> Sit down. No more discussion. And that's you know. Yeah. I, I never accepted that when no, someone I, told I, me, I you can't question this, it's the way it is because God said so. I had to find out why God said so. <laughs> okay, so I've been trying to ask you, I'm trying to understand because, you know, this brings me to the deep, abstract understanding of sacred geometry, of the universal forces. So I'm interested in understanding of how noon, the primordial waters, are created from a tomb. From the tomb, actually. The, the primordial waters come from the tomb, from the void, from the deep. So the progression is tomb, atom, a tomb, none. So it's a different derivation. Atom becomes atom, becomes the basic blocks of creation. So atom then by masturbating, creates all the other netters, creates all the principles of creation. But the nun leads to the waters, leads to the azgat, leads to the tef, leads to the water, which is the basis of life. Again, the ach has esoteric and exoteric meaning. Exoteric, it is life. It is the womb, vagina, fallopian tubes. But esoteric, it is water, because water is the key to life. So there was always dual meanings in these things. What you really want to know is how does atom lead to creation by creating all the different netters to leading to sacred geometry, it leads to seshat. Sesh becomes the people. For the, all the people, everybody. But when it's dividing then, because the women have a primary place, they call seshat before they even talk about man. Seshat, the woman. She, her consort is Jehuti. Jehuti is the masculine lunar wisdom, lunar principle of wisdom. He just, he's the moon. He's again a masculine principle of the moon, lunar principle of wisdom. Jehuti brings in the sound because what's key here is before there's creation, there is the sound. The sound. God, is, again, there's a famous Kabbalistic phrase which came out of the US in the 20s. We're talking about the name of God, yod hey vod hey, And the phrase says, it is the name, it is the sound that rushes through the universe. So the sound of God's name is creation itself. So it's the sound. He brings in the sacred sound. Before you talk about sacred geometry, you have to understand sacred sound. He gives the sound, seshat, his consort, takes the sound and she creates form. So in other words, Whenever there was any structure, edifice to be constructed, a pyramid, a temple, a tomb, whatever, the first letter invoked is Seshat because she is the patroness of sacred geometry. She takes the sound, she gives us the form, she gives us the geometrical form. Just like man gives seed to woman, woman brings forth the form. Exactly the same. 
whatever the commissions did, you could always find from an abstract, from a metaphysical to the mundane physical understanding. Because they looked at things in front of their eyes, nature, as things were happening, and that's how they created their mythology, their, myst their mysticism, based on actual observation of nature, of life itself. So there was no separation, again, between metaphysics and physics. So sacred geometry evolves as an understanding of sound creating form. And this is the great work of the modern scientist Hans Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y, who did things with sound, put a membrane in for, um, for drug with sound, and it creates form. There it is. Sound is the basis of sacred geometry. He gives it to her. Seshat is your patroness. If you're going to deal with sacred geometry, uh, uh, that's your patron letter, Seshat, with the seven-pointed lotus, the four and the three. The seven represents the square, four, three, the triangle. And the physical form becomes a star tetrahedron, which is what the Great Pyramid represents in, in solid geometry, a star tetrahedron. It all comes from Seshat's head, from the seven. And the seven is a sacred number. And every seventh is Shabbos. Seven, seven is a sacred number in every ancient system coming from here. So that's it comes from the sound to the form to the geometry. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> so that's why sound is so important. There isn't a human culture that's ever been that didn't have music, that didn't have some form of sound that they could it's sacred. If, you know, first, we're taught that our modern music comes out of religion, comes out of the church, comes out of the synagogue, comes out of the, the mosque, which is true. But the fact is, to the commissions, there was no sound that was not sacred. Every sound is sacred. Sound was the basis of creation. And therefore then sound, as Hakim laid to me a primordial principle, sound was the basis of how they built the civilization. Sound creating anti-gravity fields to lift stone. Sound in healing at Saqqara, at the hospital. The, uh, the video I sent you where I always did that sacred teaching that Hakim taught me. Sound is where they did mass healing using sound. Sound was so important. They didn't speak like we're speaking now. Again, if we go back to the age of 20,000 years ago, we would just be staring at each other now, communicating telepathically. And if we would say something, it would be to make a sacred point. But sound was sacred. It wasn't used for speech until we fall from grace. Wow. I had a very profound dream about this uh, a few days ago. Mm, tell me. Uh, it's quite bold. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really understand it at first, but uh -huh. today, I, like in the last two days, I think I understand it. Uh -huh. um, I had this really profound talk about ancient Egypt with this uh, woman that I met. And at, at night when and she's very, she, she channels and she has a lot of uh, memories from ancient Egypt and astral mm. projection experiences and stuff like that. Mm. And uh, so at night I dreamt, not about her, but I was, Meeting a, a woman coming to me from from the from the darkness, like with like in the night in, in void, and she was looking at me, and uh, it was very funny feeling, like weird. Mm. Um, and there was a sense of sexuality in the air, even though. You know, I don't find myself, you know, I'm not a lesbian, I'm a hetero, I don't, <laughs> you know, aside from the, the casual lesbian fantasy, you know, I'm attracted to, to men and I've never been like attracted to a woman that I met. So sure. it was like, like uh, she said, I can, uh, you know, we can come just by staring at each other. And we, we were like standing at a distance. Wow. And just not touching in any way, just looking. And I felt an orgasm. Wow. And you mean in the dream? Yes. Wow. That's a very ancient, ancient teaching. That is reality. At first, I didn't know how to understand it. And, and today, I had this realization, exactly what you say. It's about 
telepathic communication. Right. Right. So and uh, the use of the gaze that we lost, the use of the gaze. The gaze. The gaze. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, 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 yeah. The ability to look in each other's eyes. Well, to d direct energy, to be able to transmit energy and receive energy. Yes. We, th we think we have to touch to do that, which is nonsense. The, the, the energy is all around us. All we have to do is focus. That takes a lot of discipline, but there are tantric teachings which teach that you can bring a partner to orgasm without touching. Heterosexual and heterosexual, no difference. And again, there was no difference in ancient Kemet. I believe we're innately born bisexual. Okay, yeah. we, have, we have the capacity. It's, 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 it's our religion, it's our social structure, it's what we're taught that indicate we have to be hetero or we have to be homo, or now we have to be yeah. transgender, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, the Native Americans had five different sexes, not just two. <laughs> so they had, they had what they called the dual spirit, which is a man who dresses as a woman, and they were a natural part of their society. Same in Kemet. There was no homosexuality. No such thing. All the priestesses of Hathor at Dendara had sex whoever they wanted to. I used to say, with a doorknob, with a rock, it didn't make a difference. With a human, with an animal. I mean, again, I have a text. The Erotic Papyrus of Turin, which was discovered many, many years ago, stolen by the Catholic Church, put in a drawer in the church in Turin, which has the, uh, the, uh, the Jesus scroll. The, uh, uh, I forgot the name of it. Anyway. And it shows practices in dynastic Kemet of women having sex with animals, bestiality, which, which, which we today would consider disgusting in the sex and oh, it's against the Bible. Blah, blah, blah. What, what, it is, what does it say in this account? It shows, they actually are instruction guides for the priestesses, different sexual positions, different techniques. What? And, and showing sex with animals. Have you seen with it? Have you I seen have it? it. I have a copy of it. Can you I can give it? I can give you the text and name of the text. Hang on. I also want to say that you should, if you do not know the work of the American Drunvalo Melchizedek. I do. The be best teacher of sacred geometry. Let me show you this text. I actually found this in a bookstore in Glastonbury, England, of all places. Wow. Called Egy Egyptian erotica. Oh my God. I can send you the, I'll send you the text and the name of the authors and the publishing, how you can get it. It's very rare, very hard to find, but it has excerpts from the, from the, the Papyrus of Turin, showing women having sex with crocodiles, Donkeys, <laughs> and this is not fantasy. This was real. And what was the reason? Just whatever. Sexuality was a sacred act, exchanging of energy between two creatures, sentient. Rape was unheard of, unheard of. Rape is a patriarchal manifestation, appendage. There was no rape in ancient Kenneth, none whatsoever. So this was a collaboration between the animal and the human? Supposedly. It just showed the capability, but it also shows incredible gymnastic positions that the Egyptian, the Commission priestesses, particularly the priests of Hathors, were like world-class gymnasts, could bend themselves in any pretzel, any yogic position you could think of and have sex that way. <laughs> so is that why all the Commission net, uh, netters have... Uh, yes. Both like uh, um, animal heads. Yes. And, uh, well, again, body. that's called zoomorphia, but it's not zoof or zoophilia. Supposedly, again, the Egyptologists think that they're worshiping the animal. No, the animal represents the principle of the net. Okay. Sobek, the crocodile, the digester. In other words, Sobek represents fear, overcoming fear. Why? Because a crocodile can eat anything. Anything. Do you know when they, they find a dead crocodile and they open up the stomach, they can find tin cans. They can find a tire irons. You can find 
anything inside there besides creatures. So the crocodile can eat anything. So the idea is you give your fear to Sobek, he digests it and takes it away. So the animal represents the principle of the Neca. They're not so worshiping let's, animals. Let's talk about Sobek. Huh? So let's talk about Sobek. Crocodile at Komombo. That's his home right now. He was many, many. Sobek was a, the digester. Could take away your fears. So the initiation at Komombo, I said this again, we'll say it again. The priests would have to dive down a tank. Crocodiles would be on the bottom. They'd have to swim a long way down and there's a narrow opening where they'd have to swim by the crocodiles and then come up the other side. It's a, the final initiation to be a priest of Sobek. So if you went down and you panicked when you saw the crocodile and drowned, of course, and died, you failed. If you came up the, without swimming to the other side, you failed, you didn't pass. You went through, you passed. But again, the priests were never told the crocodiles were well fed. They could care less about somebody swimming by them. And so there never was an accident like that where the crocodile would kill a priest. But the initiation was to get past them, to get out the other side. So Sobek is fear. You're m releasing your fear. And, and, and the video I sent you, Hakim would do our initiation there where we'd crawl down a tunnel, have to come to a point where it's too narrow. You don't think you're going to make it. You have to overcome your fear and come out the other side. And there's a rebirth. When you come out, you feel reborn. So that's the whole idea. So again, the whole, all the initiations at the temples, which experience the principle of that netter and to come out the other side with the netter in you, walking with the netters. Once you pass the initiation, the netter is in you. We all have the 360 in us, not out, in. The principles of creation outside, again, as above, so below. Everything creation outside is inside. Again, the greatest statement Socrates ever said to his students was, know thyself and you will know everything. So each, each netter is an initiation, an understanding, and to call that principle within yourself awakened. We're taught that we're born in this age of Amun with the veil over our eyes. We don't remember who we are. We have to remember who we are and remove the veil. And the greatest is the Sphinx herself. Again, Tefnut, she's the biggest veil. When people think it's a male, a male guy, a pharaoh making an offering to the sun. They still, everybody says, ha harakte, ha harakte. Nobody says Tefnu, not even Hakim's son, who, who to learn this from me and his father, does he call the Sphinx Tefnu? No. To be compassionate and to understand that everyone will understand on, on their own time. Or they won't. <laughs> and they'll leave this plane. Because uh, the energy of the earth, again, 50 years from now, uh, 40 years from now, is going to be very different than it is today. And people are going to have to be in that vibratory essence of understanding to be able to survive on the physical. People will uh, awaken faster. faster. They have, that's the goal. That's the hope. That's what I, we're doing. That's what you're doing. That's why you want to bring these teachings out, to wake people up. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Um, so, like, to close the very fascinating conversation we had today, um, would you like uh, to to end this uh, discussion with another pair of netters that you think is significant? Well, I was just thinking of Hathor because you had spoken about Hathor. The, uni the, the uniqueness of Hathor is that there were no male priests. She was only served by priestesses. But as I tell people, people always ask me, well, what's your favorite site? <laughs> and I go from Tefnut. Each site you go to becomes a favorite site. But I used to say the real thing about going to Dendara, which is great for everybody, is as soon as you get in there, you feel the energy. You bathe in the sweet, soft, gentle energy of the feminine, yes. of love. It's interesting because a lot of the discussions I'm seeing on American TV now, particularly about this impeachment trial, which is just over, about the American political situation, is American religious leaders now are standing up about this false use of Christianity in America because they're not talking about what was the basic of Jesus' teachings. Love. Love. Do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. That concept seems to be gone 
from a modern society. People don't talk about love. And I, it's very, again, I'm, I'm going to leave you with something very profound. And I think I, I had discussed this with you before, but I'm going to do it again. Einstein, before he died, he wrote a letter to his daughter. Do not open his daughter until years after I'm dead, he said, because people will not understand it. Supposedly, she, she opened it before she died. And what was it talking about? Einstein said the greatest force that there is in existence is the one that's least understood by humanity, and that's love. It's never considered a force in physics, but it was the most important force to the ancient commissions. Hathor, Sechmet, Tefnut, all represented the mother, Nut. They considered the greatest force there is the unconditional love of mother. The greatest force there is. So we don't teach how would we call the great mother? Newt. 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 Newt is the great mother. Ha Hakim would say, that's the goddess of the sky. But of course, she's not a god. She's not a goddess. She is everything that is created and everything that is uncreated. When she physically manifested, she spit to become the Sphinx Tefnut. But everything comes from her. Everything comes from Newt. And everything comes from mother. That's how they taught. All principles go back to mother. And to the love of mother. That's the basis. So that's the only, that is the force that's going to save. If human beings are going to survive now into 2050 and beyond to the 22nd century, we're going to have to understand that love is the greatest force there is. And these wars have to end. These separations have to end. We have to end the separation of Amun. The us and them, us and them. It's only the sesh is only us. There's nothing else. And everything is connected to everything else. And the universe is conscious and everything is conscious. Commission's taught not just humans, not just animals, but rocks and stones and water all had consciousness. So Sesh is us. Us, the people. It's, yes. Again, in the movie The Little Big Man, which is uh, Dustin Hoffman talking about uh, uh, the Cheyenne, the Native American group, they called themselves the human beings. That's what they were, the human beings. So there was no male, female, black, white, Jew, Christian. No, it was just the sesh. And, and people think, well, that meant you had a, 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 a herd mentality. Nobody had individual. No, there was individuality. People knew, uh, you knew that you were to do dance, to, to do tattooing, whatever we come to. I knew that I was to be a scientist, this and that. We all have a function. We all have a role that... We have come in to create, but we're just part of the puzzle. Nobody's higher than anybody else. Hierarchy comes with patriarchy. Hierarchy comes with the king and then everybody else, under, the priests and everybody else underneath. Then it becomes male white supremacy. The white males at the top, everybody else comes after. Those are all artificial, artificial constructs. We're all just the sesh. And that was one of his most profound teachings. He said, just be the sesh, he'd say. Don't worry, black, white, Jew, Christian, those are irrelevant. We are the sesh. Wow. <laughs> okay, wow, that was a brilliant conversation. Well, great. I love it too. And uh, we'll have uh, many more, I'm sure. Yes. So uh, until next time. Okay. Uh, we'll say goodbye for tonight, for today. Uh, next Tuesday might work for me, so I'll see if it works for you. Sure, we'll talk before. We'll okay. Talk thank you so much. It was fascinating. And thank you so much for the knowledge. And I just hope, you know, this helps a lot of people. And slowly, you know, we'll see big changes in our world and start to awaken and understand, you know, the what is sacred in this life and what is important. And everything. Love, love <laughs> that's is the, the thing. thing that's important. Everything, nothing is not important. Everything has a part. Everything is important. The most trivial things we can think of have a role or are important. Yes. And now that I know that your real interest is sacred geometry, we can slant a lot of our conversations that way because that was a major topic of interest for me for at least 40 years now. Yes. I mean, there are many great pioneers in sacred geometry. An American musician named Jonathan Goldman, who I can send you pictures, Bed Hakim, lives here in Boulder, Colorado. He's put out many CDs. He has a, a website, Music Healing Sounds, Healing Sounds, Music for Healing. 
uh, he's tremendous into sacred geometry and to uh, sound as healing. And uh, he met Hakim here. So. Wonderful. So we'll talk about uh, a lot more about sacred geometry in ancient uh, Kemet. We will. And uh, wonderful. So have a great day. You too, and, and a happy we'll weekend. Talk soon. Okay. Thanks for everybody Shalom. who watched us, and uh, we'll come again soon. Bye bye. Shalom. Bye bye. Bye bye.